understanding of our heart relate to God's word and our response to it. And then I want to spend some time looking at the Passover. Um, often misunderstood. So let's open in a word of prayer and then we'll, be, we'll begin together. Let us pray. Our Father in God, we thank you for um, this hour where we can gather um, as those who have life in Christ, the one who, who gave himself up, uh, who pursued the cross and laid down his life of his own accord. And, and, and because of your glory and his, his glory took it up again. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who gives life and who, who loves to teach us, your people, through your word. Uh, teach us more about your character, um, the goodness and severity of the Lord, as Paul says. Thank you for your mercy toward us and your just judgments. Lord, your, your ways are often beyond finding out, and yet here we have very clear uh, revelation of, of the way you deal with uh, those who are not your people, those who would oppose your people. And you deliver your people with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Help us to hope um, in your redemption that is to come uh, when your son returns. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's look at the plagues real quick. You know, if, if we look at the plagues, like what, what's going on? Really, they're, they're signs, of course. They're, they're aspects of decreation. God is taking his creation and what he's doing, he's throwing it into all sorts of disarray. When you think of the plagues in that regard, um, let's look at the. They, there are really three sets of three here. So that's going to give you nine. And really, the first one comes, usually, it's early morning. Early morning, Moses goes to meet Pharaoh. Second one comes, kind of, it's usually afternoon. And then the third one is, of course, without warning. That's kind of the pattern. So one, four, seven, Moses goes to meet with Pharaoh early. They have a little discussion back and forth. And then the plague comes the second one. You know, Moses comes in the afternoon typically to warn him. And the third one's without warning. And so let's look at, um, let, let's look at how these, these plagues. And I, I want to I look at... Um, Really, that God's judgment is testifying to his authority here. And if you remember way back, let's look at the first, the first plague, of course, is the water that's going to be turned to blood. And there's all sorts of naturalistic explanations. You can get on Google and look at those. And there's an insane flood in July. And the Nile flooded like never before. And this caused like, you know, mud and silt to cause all the water to turn red. And there was stagnant pools. And then bacteria grew. And, you know, frogs died. And then, you know, these... Locusts came, and the dust was flown in there. You got all these naturalistic, naturalistic explanations of the plague. I'm not quite convinced that's exactly what happened, but it may be plausible. Certainly the last one is a supernatural, sobering judgment of the firstborn. But let's look at the first plague with the water turned to blood. This is chapter 7, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him. And take in your hand the staff that he turned, that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile. And it shall be turned to blood. So you have the fish dying, the Nile stinking, Egyptians growing weary, right? And then Moses does it and it turns to blood. And then if you look in verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. And they're like, hey, we can do this too. No big deal. So what, what's happening here with the first plague? Go ahead, Barry. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, if you go through all the plagues, there's a there's an uh, what's the word congruent kind of Egyptian god associated with each of the plagues of this decreation that God's triumphing over. Um, the water turned to blood, though. That, that's, that's important. You have to think all the way back to Exodus. Exodus, remember at the very beginning, we encountered uh, the Hebrew midwives. And what was Pharaoh doing to this, these Israelite boys? Throw them in the Nile. Throw them in the Nile. So you, again, this is an aspect of, of creations testifying now against the sin of the Egyptians. The, the Nile Pharaoh was, was um, advising the Hebrew midwives and those who were around any Hebrew baby to throw the baby in the Nile. The Nile is really this, 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 this graveyard that is covered up. They've concealed the bodies in this place. And now, of course, the blood of the bodies is covered up in the water. It's a nation that this, this Egypt is a nation that has been built upon covering up its crime. And now Egypt's crime is unmistakable. It's unavoidable. It's a sign of remembrance of Israel's suffering. You know, the waters of the Nile, they continue to flow. What do they flow? They flow like south to north, right? I think one of two rivers in the world that does that. As they flow, they just look, you look on the surface very peaceable. But what lies underneath all those waters? Probably thousands and thousands and thousands of bodies of babies that, that the Hebrews' wives had snatched away from them and thrown into the Nile. The waters flowed as if there were no bodies at all, as if our children had not been murdered or killed in the Nile. But now creation testifies to the sin of the Egyptians. It's also an anticipation, I think, of the blood that God will shed of the firstborn of Egypt. This first plague is not just, oh, water into blood. No, it's, it, there's a whole narrative connected here. And, and through it all, God is, is just. He says, listen to this warning here. It's in Ezekiel 32. You consider yourself a line of the nations, but you are like a dragon in the seas. You burst forth in your rivers and trouble the waters with your feet and foul the rivers. Thus says the Lord your God, I will throw my net over you with the host of many peoples and they will haul you up with my dragnet and I will cast you on the ground in an open field. I will fling you and cause all the birds of the heavens to settle on you and I will gorge the beasts of the whole earth with you. I will stew your flesh upon the mountains. I will fill the valleys with your carcass. I will drench the lands, even the mountains, with your flowing blood, and the ravines will be full of you. Like sobering language, right? You may think, well, that's Ezekiel. That's thousands of years later. Like, again, it's, it's a picture. People think God is just what? Love. Yeah, just love, just merciful. And it's kind of understandable, right? Because when you think of Christ's first coming, He comes not to condemn and to judge, but to save, right? But of course, there's the second coming of Christ, which is like sobering language in Revelation. Like the whole counsel of God is He comes, robe dipped in blood, sword of truth, the word of God in His mouth, judging justly. Our God is a righteous judge. Like it's, it, He's both merciful and yet righteous and holy and just. And this first plague is, is really telling for all those reasons. Egypt's like a graveyard. And, and you think, like, why doesn't God just whisk His people away, right? Why go through all this, these shenanigans with the plagues? What do you think he's doing there, class? Don't be shy. Why, why, why go through all the plagues? Is he just vindictive and you know, a little overkill or harsh justice? Overzealous? Reciprocity? Retributive justice here by God? Or is it just? Like, why doesn't he just whisk Israel away? These are signs that show forth his Yeah, he's defeating Hopi, the god of the Egyptians in the Nile on his home turf. He's triumphing over their gods. And what else is he doing? He's teaching his people about who he is. <laughs> and they need to learn that, right? They, they've been in, in Egypt for so long. They've heard the stories about their fathers, but they haven't seen the mighty acts of God's deliverance. They haven't learned the full orb of his character. Now, these plagues go basically, um, the plagues move upwards from the very base of Egypt and the Nile up through the buildings of Pharaoh to the waters, you know, above and, and it, it's, it's, wild. it's wild. Exodus is more than just delivering Israel and judging the Egyptians for their sins. It's God showing who he is. It's his and him demonstrating his power. And these different plagues, um, they speak to different realms of Egyptian deities. And so let's, let's 
skip ahead and, and look at some of the other, other plagues. Um, I want to look, I want to skip ahead to chapter 9 there. Skip ahead to chapter 9. And this is the, the fifth plague. We have the Egyptian livestock dying. There's boils and then hail. Six, uh, five, six, seven. Okay, now remember, the plagues go in the cycle of morning, chit-chat with Pharaoh, afternoon, and then no warning at all. And so let's look at chapter 9. Mo verse 1, Moses goes in to Pharaoh, right? Look at, thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague on your livestock that are in the field, horses, donkeys, camels, herds, and flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction, right, between God and his, and, you know, his people and Egypt. And then we see Pharaoh's hearts hardened. And then there's boils breaking out. And Pharaoh's hearts hardened. And so when you think about it, Moses goes in by himself. You think of all the livestock. The natural order of and creation is being set in disarray on account of the sin of human beings, right? Why should livestock die? They shouldn't die, in a sense. Pharaoh should just let them go, <laughs> and the Egyptian livestock should be just fine. And when you, when you think about um, what, what it says in Romans, because we, in a sense, when humanity sinned, we threw all of, all of creation into this disarray where you see the language in Romans that what? Creation groans, right? Creation groans. It's, it's subjected to futility. Let's look in the Romans passage. Creation's groaning on account of the sin of humanity. It's Romans 8. Look, look what Paul says in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are no big deal. No, he doesn't say that. It's not true. Your sufferings are a very big deal. They're a huge deal. And they're very, very painful, if we're honest, right? Like, understanding this, this verse, it says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Or even it could say, in us. It's hard with that preposition. And so when you think of your present sufferings, don't look at this verse and say, oh, no big deal. No big deal. Let's focus on the glory to come. Well, they are a big deal. And they're very painful. And they hurt very bad. The sufferings of soul, the sufferings of body and soul. Like, it's hard. But his, he's, he's mindful that, okay, compared to your own life, it's very hard. But compared to the glory to come, like there's such a greater glory to come. And when you think of the glory to come, it's either the glory that's to be revealed in you, which is your Christ likeness, or it's the glory that's to be revealed to you, which is your Savior and your beloved elder brother and your Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he acknowledges their sufferings. And then look what he says about creation. Look. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God. Why? For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Like, why did God, why is, why is creation subjected to futility? Yeah, because of sin, but he subjects it in hope. Like, that's, that's weird. And you think of creation. It's in bondage to corruption. Look, look what he says in verse 21. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For you know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. So when you, when you think of creation being subjected to futility, we have these uncreation acts, like almost decreation acts with the plague, right? We have livestock that's going to die because of Pharaoh's sin. Why doesn't he just let them go, right? It should be that easy. It's a picture of, of the effects of sin on creation. And then Paul says, of course, in Romans 8, that 
Creation subjected to futility. And that creation is groaning. Groaning. And then who else groans? Do you know? We groan. We groan. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly. Why do we groan inwardly? Because the sufferings of the present time. You got it? If it was just smooth sailing, boom, we wouldn't do a lot of groaning. Like, there's present sufferings that are very real. And what Paul is saying there is, it's not that your sufferings aren't real, not that they're no big deal. They're a huge deal, and they're very painful. Creation's groaning, you're groaning, and yet we groan because there's, a, there's inherent futility or corruption to creation. Like, one of the reasons God subjected it to futility, it says in hope, the thing that creation will never, ever, ever give you is complete satisfaction. Unless what? Unless you're an idolater, right? <laughs> then you'll be deceived into complete satisfaction with, with creation, but it'll never cash out. And you'll end up groaning without the first fruits, which is like sobering hell judgment. So when he says, he, when he says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. It's not that your sufferings aren't great. It's that this glory that's to be revealed is so much greater. And you think of the sufferings of the present time. Think of the futility of creation. It's corruption. Like all of creation. Think of your own groaning inwardly. And you groan inwardly, he says, as you wait and hope. And so as this relates to the plagues, there's a lot of decreation going on. Pharaoh's going to kill all these livestock on account, or God's going to kill all the livestock on account of Pharaoh's sin. God subjected creation to futility and this corruption on account of Adam's sin. And because of that, we groan. You see, the people of Egypt are going to be groaning and crying out. Moses is going to go out from Pharaoh hot under the collar because Pharaoh doesn't want to let God's people go. And so let's look, let's look at this... Um, this, this plague. I would say groan, I just my application for you, is groan with hope, Christian. Like, creation groans, we groan who have the first fruit of the Spirit. It's not sinful to groan. It's a reality of life lived under the sun in this present evil age. And so many people are so afraid, they're like, okay, well, I'll, I kind of need to lament to God, but I don't want to grumble because grumbling is sinful. So I just won't, I won't even lament because I might sin. So I won't even like pray to God or, or groan in prayer to God because, you know, I might sin and then it's bad to sin, so I shouldn't do that. No, pray. Remember what Luther, remember what Luther said to Melanchthon? He said, sin boldly. Sounds scandalous, doesn't it? Like, I'm not telling you to, to grumble and gnash your teeth against God. What I'm telling you to do is pray. And if you happen to sin and, and accidentally grumble against God, he'll forgive you. At least you're talking to the right person. <laughs> the one who truly loves and cares and knows your groaning and knows your heart and longs for you to bring your heart to him. It's the reason, um, it's the reason why he's acting in Exodus this way. That he might have a people for himself. To have a relationship with them. And they got to go through all the temple and the types and the shadows. And we just, you know, um, for with boldness and access with confidence, we can come to, the, to, the, to Christ, right? Through this grace in which we stand. It's grace. So there's grace. So my, my, my main point is, don't not pray because you're worried about grumbling. Like, pray. And if you happen to sin, like, God forgives. Like, repent. And at least you're talking to the right person. <laughs> A lot of groaning. Don't think, oh yeah, creation groans. Oh, God knows. No, just talk. Commune with him. Commune with him. Um, let's look at the, the boils. Um, we, we start to move from inconvenience, really. Oh, the water and the frogs and the gnats, the, the livestock. We're moving from like inconvenience to what? Personal discomfort here. There's no prior warning. When you think of the plague and the boils, let's look how this happens here. Verse 8 of chapter 9. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from the kiln, and let Moses throw them in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. 
Now, when you think of the kiln, what should you think of? Remember how they wanted to build um, the Tower of Babel? What did they use? They burned the bricks thoroughly. Do you remember that? Where do you think they burned them? In a kiln? Now, when, when Israel was being treated real harshly, make bricks, hey, we're not even going to give you straw, you've got to gather it yourself. Where do you think they burned the bricks? In a kiln. And so when you think of the first plague, turning the water of the Nile into blood, it's exposing the sin of, you know, the, the death and the killing and the murdering of all the infants that were just cast into the Nile. The water flowed like nothing happened. No Pharaoh turns it to blood. This is blood's upon you. Like here, he's, he's exposing like the harsh treatment of the Israelites. Grab the, throw it in the air. It's going to become boils on these Egyptians because of the harsh treatment. It's, it's an aspect of God judging Pharaoh um, on account of the harsh slavery and the treatment of the Israelites. And of course, how does he respond to that? Well, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. And so what's happening here is the magicians have been getting knocked out. Aaron's no longer kind of mediating between uh, Moses and Pharaoh. And what you have is now that the Egyptians and Aaron's out of the picture, we're, get, we're preparing to have the showdown between Moses and Pharaoh. Moses and Pharaoh, where God's going to get deliverance. Um, I guess the hail's a good one for us to look at. Let's look at the seventh plague of the hail. Go ahead, Barry. When I was teaching way back in the day when I was living in Reseda, there was, I looked at the encyclopedia we have in the library by uh, Sonderman. Yeah. There was an article by Scientific American in there. It tells how they do lightning and all that. That's, one of, that's the only meteorological plague of the ten. In other words, it's... The hail? Yeah, the lightning and all that stuff. Yeah, so. yeah. Some people say it's some wild volcano that went off. Um, they try to have the naturalistic explanations. So, let's look at this hail. This is interesting. The Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning. Remember, three plagues. Three sets of three. The first one, one, four, and seven, are Moses going in in the morning. Okay? Two, five, and eight are an afternoon. And then, of course, three, six, and nine are no warning at all, right? The one with the, the, the dust that he just threw up, no warning at all. People got boils. They were all been out of shape, okay? This one is, again, early morning warning. Verse 14, you know, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send my plagues on you yourself, on your servants and your people, so that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name, me bro my name me may be proclaimed in all the earth. You are still exalting yourself against my people, and will not let them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall, such as never been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore... Send, get your livestock and all that you have in the field into safe shelter. For every man and beast that is in the field and that is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. This is key here, verse 20. Then whoever feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh hurried his slaves and his livestock into houses. But whoever did not pay attention to the word of the Lord left his slaves and his livestock in the field. Then Moses said, so the Lord says, you know, stretch out your hand. There's thunder, there's hail, there's lightning. Okay, and there's a distinction. And then look at Pharaoh's response here. Verse 27, Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, This time I have sinned. The Lord is in the right. And I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, right? He wants Moses to intercede. Look what Moses says. But as for you and your servants, verse 30, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord. So then verse 33, Moses goes out from the city. Verse 34, but when Pharaoh saw the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. He did not let the people of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. So what's happening here? 
Pharaoh acknowledges he sinned. And then he sins again by hardening his heart. And he says, you know, you don't fear the Lord. How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? There's two perspectives on this. And you have to realize, the hardening of the heart always happens in response to the Word of God. I should probably say the Word of God or the revelation of God. That's... Because when it comes to the Word of God, that's special revelation, right? Special revelation. You think of the, the natural light that's from God that God's written on the heart about right and wrong, good and bad. General, yes. And if you harden your heart to the revelation of God that He's written on your conscience, what happens? Your conscience becomes seared. You become very callous. And of course, you can still shed tears when things go wrong sometimes. And have an inkling of, you know, I did wrong, this was wrong. But then apart from God's grace and mercy, what's going to happen? You're just going to be like a dog returning to your vomit. You no power to change. And so, does God move Pharaoh's will? And disposition toward evil? That's one take. I don't think that's right, right? That's not an option because humans freely act according to their nature. Um, This is not an example of God doing something against Pharaoh's will. (laughs) It's not like God's making making Pharaoh move or do something he doesn't want to do. He's not infusing Pharaoh's will with some sort of vice or evil inclination. He's not doing that. What God's doing is He's refusing to soften His heart by withholding the grace of the Holy Spirit. Augustine had a great quote. I want want to read it to you. We must not think that anything is imposed by God whereby a man is made worse, but only that He provides nothing whereby a man is made better. Did you hear that? That's a great one. I'll read it again. So Augustine's concern is, Don't think that God's like imposing something and making someone worse. All God's doing is like withholding something to make someone be better. We must not think that anything is imposed by God whereby a man is made worse, but only that he provides nothing whereby a man is made better. And I would just say for you, you guys who struggle with those in your lives who have really hardened hearts, one of the ways God may show grace is through your love and through your kindness. So don't lose hope. Like, He provides nothing whereby a man is made better. Only the light of the gospel, as as you bear witness to it about sin and forgiveness and repentance, or the light of your loving kindness. But remember, some people who have really hard hearts are just, it's all about themselves. You have to love God, you have to love neighbor, and you have to love yourself properly. It's important to have that proper perspective. It's not just, oh, let me just love them. <laughs> They'd love that, right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Okay? Um, but, y- you know, don't, it's not, not, don't hand them over to their own hearts. Let, leave that up to God. You just be faithful wherever God's called you, however he's called you to love others. You know, Luther, Luther um, has this big debate with Erasmus. In the bondage of the will. And Erasmus claims that God hardens Pharaoh's heart by giving him a number of occasions to harden his own heart. And Luther counters. He says, you know, God provokes Pharaoh into showing his true colors. And you think, provokes Pharaoh? That sounds like, you know, he's moving his inclination toward evil, provoking Pharaoh. Like, Luther, what are you talking about? How does God provoke Pharaoh to show his true colors? How do you guys think he does that class? With what? With the word of God. <laughs> With the word of God from Moses as it comes to Pharaoh. Luther says, uh, God, prov- or God provokes Pharaoh into showing his true colors by thrusting him through with the words of Moses. <laughs> the words of Moses are not evil words, but they would seem like evil words according to Pharaoh. Why? Well, there goes my labor force. There goes my free labor. There goes my authority over all these people. Great loss and great expense to me. Do, do you see how that, that seems like uh, that's, that's evil, right? But it's not. It goes against his will and against his authority and against his pride. Yes. Yeah. And what happens to your heart when that happens? You think of Luther, the way he explains it. Look, look, listen to what he says. Um, Through Moses, God's prompting Pharaoh to show his true colors by the pattern of his response or his lack of response. God, through Moses, presents his words and works to Pharaoh. He can respond in one of two ways. Trust and obey, or not at all. 
And do you know who else could respond that way? <laughs> All of us, right? You think of hard-hearted people. When does your heart become hard? You ever been in a time in your life where you didn't want to open the Bible and read it because you didn't want to hear God call you out for a certain behavior? Or maybe you were so overwhelmed with grief, you doubted that the Lord was truly good and had done good. And you know you'd rather flee from him or put him off to the side. Um, rather not talk to him. The hard-hearted person is one who repeatedly refuses and rejects God's word, who rebuts God's overtures, creation, conscience, canon. Like, it's, it can happen. Go ahead, Larry. Uh, don't we all do that? Uh, or didn't, didn't we all do that apart from God's grace? Yeah, and I, th I think we still do rebut God's word in creation, conscience, and canon. So we look at Pharaoh and say, that's a ding you know? Yeah. He just kept making the wrong choices. Well, we did too, apart from God's grace. Yeah. We were running away from him until he graciously saved us. Yeah. So, you know, it's so easy to point the finger at other people, and yet it was us. Yeah, our hearts, you think of the language like a heart of stone or diamond hard in some of the prophets. Like, that would be our hearts, apart from his grace. And it's his kindness, he says in Romans, that what? That leads us to repentance. Psalm says he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Like, you with a strict sense of justice, you may want to treat other people as their sins deserve. You may want to feel like God treats yourself as your sins deserve. And then you walk around in shame and guilt and feel like you can't approach God because your sins deserve you to be far off. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. You don't deserve God. But that's why he came and that's why you can come to him. That's why he'll never let you go. He who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. He will never, ever, ever cast us off. Because he treated Christ like our sins. Exactly. And, and Christ was raised. And though we groan, creation groans, like the Spirit intercedes with groans, words that cannot be uttered. Christ is interceding. at the, He doesn't give help to angels. Well, who does He give help to? The offspring of Abraham. Like, it's, it's so beautiful. So, when you think of the Word of God, you know, these dialogues between Moses and Pharaoh, they're diagnostic. These dialogues are diagnostic. God's word as you read it is diagnostic. It shows you where does your heart lie? Do you love God? I don't mean if you love him more than you'll be saved. No, you're saved because he loves you and sent Christ for you. You trust in that. But you, absolutely you're to love him more. Love him as much as you can, as much as you're able with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Live for him. Your life is not your own. You belong to this one who's redeemed you, who's delivered you. It's not works righteousness. It's a response of the great redemption and salvation God's given us. And so this, this, the words are, the dialogue is diagnostic. That's kind of the main thing. Um, today, if you hear his voice, Psalm 95 says, what? Do not harden your heart, right? He gives this whole picture of Israel and their wilderness wanderings. Don't be like them. They idolatry, they, they sexual morality drunkenness, uh, frivolousness, playing, right? You got it all. Like, that's their warnings. Their warnings. Um, let's skip ahead a little bit to the Passover. Pastor, question. Yeah. Um, are you going to touch on, or what, why does it seem like, uh, as far as what I could understand, that some of the plagues happened to everybody, and some of them spared the land of Goshen. They sent the Israelites that were in Goshen. It didn't happen over there. But that was still in Egypt. So some of the plagues happened to everyone. And I imagine the Israelites too. I don't know. But some of them just happened to the Egyptians, it seems. Is that correct? Or yeah, I think God's sparing his people and protecting his people. He's making a distinction between his people and Egypt. To show forth yeah, his, his glory. Father. Yeah, and, the, and the same thing is, he who blesses you, I will bless. He who dishonors you, I will curse. Right? That promise was given like 455 years ago, right? 700 years ago to Abraham. Long time ago to Abraham. And this is playing out of that great promise. Um, Even in nine years, in my translation, let my people go so that they may worship me for this time 
I will send the full force of my plague against you and your officials. So I kind of want to read that. It, it sounds like they had a free pass before. Or yeah, these are the elite officials, the inner circle. And now they're going to be experiencing like God's judgment. Usually, you know, the officials, they're up in their high palace and they have water from wherever. You know, they're not affected. They close the blinds at night if the gnats are coming. Right? You get the picture. But now it's officials. And it's these same officials we're going to see. If you look in, um, look in, uh, where is it? My goodness. Look in chapter 11 when this final plague is threatened. This is judgment time. Judgment time. Um, there's been a, there's an interlude here in chapter 11. It's a little pause before the final fla- plague is threatened. Look what he says here. Yet once more. Right? Moses has already said like at this point, it's like, hey, okay, I'll let you go. I'll let you go. Leave your children. Leave your children. No, we can't go. We all got to go. And he says, okay, I'll let you go. Just leave your livestock. Moses says, no, no, no. We all got to go. And so here's the, here's the last one. Yet one more plague. Speak in the hearing of the people, right? So plunder the Egyptians, right? And then in verse 4, look in verse 4. Uh, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, to even the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor will ever be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. To Larry's point, right? And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, this is, again, Moses speaking to Pharaoh here. Get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. And that Moses and Aaron do all these wonders, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. So, back to Tom's point, great point. He does this to the Egyptians, specifically Pharaoh's servants. And then now the picture is, they're all going to come to Moses and say, hey, get out of here. They're going to come bow down. So you see like a difference between Pharaoh who would be bowed down and, you know, to everyone, and now what happens? The people are now bowing down to Moses. And they're begging him to go. Yet one more plague. There's a reversal of roles here with Moses and Israel. And why does Moses go away so hot under the collar? He was raised in Egypt. A prince of Egypt. You think of the cry, the great cry. How How did Moses even become to be raised in Egypt? Pharaoh's daughter heard him crying. And his cries are basically emblematic of all those cries that were never heard that are buried in the bottom of the Nile. And now God is going to get this rectifying justice on Egypt and strike down the firstborn for all the firstborn of Israel's that that were executed and murdered because of Pharaoh's pride and his obstinacy. It's a great cry. And of course, Israel was crying out too because of what? The harsh slavery and the burdens, right? (laughs) The treatment. But I want to talk about chapter 12 real quick. Moses is, there's a distinction made between God's people and the people of Egypt. And when you think of the Passover, often it's misunderstood. It's really misunderstood. It's like what's often pictured is, um, gives the idea that God's passing through Egypt and taking the life of each one who firstborn that doesn't have the blood on the lentil and the doorposts. That's not the best understanding. So let's look at the language of the text. Okay. What we've been told so far in chapter 11, verse 4, I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Okay, that's what God says there. And when you skip ahead, look, it's a big feast. Look, look what he says, um, verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians of chapter 12 here. And when he sees the blood on the lentil and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. What's happening there? Like, I think people have the picture that God just skips by or just on to the next when he sees the blood. That's not what's happening. When you think of the language, um, 
Pasha. He says, when I see the blood, verse 13, what, what's going to happen? Verse 13 of chapter 12. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So it seems like the Lord's passing over, but then look what he says in verse 23. The Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you. The, the language quite literally is like, Pasha is the Lord hovering over. The, the, the picture is the Lord's going to pass through with the destroyer to judge Egypt. Okay? All those who don't have the blood. But then what he's going to do quite literally is hover over the doors of Egypt who have the blood on it as the destroyer passes through. Like literally that's the language that's happening. And so it's not like the Lord saying, okay, you get a pass. It's the Lord like coming through in judgment and then the Lord also coming through in protection. And you see, you see this in Psalm 91. Listen to this. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with the pinions under his wings and you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You shall not fear the terror of the night. Pestilence that stalks in the darkness, right? A thousand may fall at your right hand, 10,000 at your left, right? You see, that's a, like a prosperity gospel favorite passage, right? But what's the picture? It's people hovering in the refuge of God. And so the Passover, quite literally, is God's people taking refuge in the sign of the blood and the Lord accepting that and hovering over them as the destroyer passes through. And my application for you is as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's happening is God's judgment will come to all. Christ will shield you and cover you. And the visible sign you have of that, the assurance you have of that, is the gospel. But it's also your baptism. Because when you think of the, the flood of judgment is often referred to the waters of come over me, they're your breakers. Like the flood of judgment during the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will wipe away everyone unless they've taken refuge in the sun. And that's what we've done on the cross. God sent Christ. He spreads wide his arms. He, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the one who takes refuge in him will never ever be put to shame. You'll always be covered um, because you've been cleansed. Um, because God loves you. And so the picture of the Passover isn't God skipping. It's God bearing the judgment himself, right? It's a picture almost of Christ saying, no, take shelter in here, Christian, and you are mine and you are saved. By faith, do this act. By faith, we receive him and there's no condemnation for us. And so just continue to take refuge in him. Take refuge in him who came for you. That's why he came. Um, let, me, let me close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for uh, your word and um, your son who has conquered sin and death and who has made us alive. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Um, thank you for this class, Lord. And I pray that you would continue to turn us to your word and Lord, that you would soften our hearts as we open it. So often we think we're our own and yet we belong to you in body and soul and life and in death. So thank you we have nothing to fear, though there are many things that, that do scare us. Um, may we take refuge in you, our shield and our fortress and our helper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.